This is Abraham D. Krikorian of Port Jefferson, Long Island, New York. It's April 2013. As one gets older, one frequently finds oneself reminiscing about the past. In this particular series of talks, I'm going to talk about my involvement in spaceflight experimentation. We'll be more precise as time goes on in the course of these presentations. I'll say at the outset that the materials shown will have been compiled by me and narrated by me. The narration and commentary will be extemporaneous, that is to say none of this is scripted, and it's intended to be spontaneous. One of my favorite expressions is that scientific discovery and maturation of scientific thought is a process, not an event. There is no eureka moment, and this is particularly emphasized in space biology experimentation where it takes quite a long time to achieve a level of understanding from which one can then use additional, more precise tests to evaluate various hypotheses. Some even suggested that these were fishing expeditions and not scientific endeavors. So be it. One has to start somewhere. And now that the use of space biology as a tool to do more detailed experimentation and evaluation of the role of gravity in growth and development and all the other aspects that I'll talk about briefly, one has to recognize that this development involved a lot of people, a lot of key events, many of which are now all but forgotten, and that while can think very cosmically in terms of milestones, some of the events were milestones and they will probably be highlighted and come into better focus so that one can fully appreciate that what I'm going to talk about is not just casual reminiscences. Part one will deal with aspects of gravitational and space biology, very generally. We'll see that at the beginning, there was what came to be called by one of the people who worked for NASA, care and feeding of astronauts. That was somewhat in tongue in cheek, but it really meant that the main emphasis was going to be care and feeding of astronauts in the space environment. One had to really argue that the space environment could offer other opportunities for discovery in terms of basic science especially biology. But one doesn't just start off doing experiments in space. It too is a process. More than a little bit of time will be given to the development of a liaison with the Soviets because the Soviets had to cooperate and that was largely on a political level at the high mucky muck level as it were. But at the lower level of the actual scientists who had to cooperate. And this was by a happy set of circumstances that made the interaction a little bit more than uh, superficial or forced upon one. And we'll see that involve some interesting personalities. The Soviet Cosmos series were rather early apparently, I've forgotten when they started, but Cosmos 782 the flight that we're going to be talking about at the outset was to lift off in 1975. The recovery date was actually 17 December. It was a 20-day flight, and it was a particularly interesting flight, not only because it was the first one, but as we'll see, it had a centrifuge on board to allow one to achieve a so-called 1G control. The specific title of Cosmos 782 was, in fact, Morphogenetic Responses of Cultured Totipotent Cells of Wild Carrot, Daucus Corota, Linnae, Queen Anne's Lace, 
at zero gravity. Abraham D. Krikorian and F. C. Stewart, Department of Biological Sciences, State University of New York at Stony Brook, Stony Brook, New York. And in fact, we've given the NASA contract and the date of the final report. Now there's something that we can say right at the outset here. It shows a little bit of the naivete that obtained at that time because the mere use of the word zero gravity implies that there is in fact no gravity in that particular space environment. Well, we'll see that it's not true. The mentality has gotten more refined as time has passed and with more learning. And one talks about hypogravity, microgravity, a low gravity, and so on. But zero gravity, it's going to be very difficult to achieve, and we'll give an example or two of those rare opportunities to achieve low gravity. Now, preparations were done at Stony Brook, and you'll see that the more recent logo for the university does in fact imply that there's a bit of a, an attempt to reach the cosmos, reach for the stars. And while one can say good or bad things about this particular logo, I happen to like it, there was an earlier one that obtained during the period of Cosmos 782, which was far more, uh, let's say, traditional. It was the tree of knowledge the University at Stony Brook, that is to say SUNY, State University of New York at Stony Brook. Someone must have thought that that needed a little bit of modernizing, but for what it is, I think it was a good one, and we have been superseded, as it were, in time. Now, this is a photograph of me on the left and F.C. Stewart on the right. F.C. Stewart used to sign his name F.C. He didn't like his first name Frederick. His middle name was Campion. His nickname was Camp, which was an abbreviation, of course, of Campion. On occasion, what would come across people referring to him as Fred, and of course that gave away the fact that they didn't know him well at all. I finished my PhD in 1965. We got along quite well and we became good friends. I learned a great deal from him. He, he had a lot of experimental uh, experience doing a wide range of studies. And the interesting thing in each of these cases was that he was a leader of the pack. He didn't measure up very well by modern day standards of doing a crucial experiment. He thought in big terms. And I liked the idea that one could, in fact, pioneer new areas and cast a wide, wide net. One of the things that he taught me, and that's been an important lesson, is that one can become a majority of one. That is to say, one should not be swayed away from firm convictions unless there's a reason to do so based on sound reasons of knowledge, experimental data, and change of conviction. He didn't like the fact that many people hunted in packs, as he put it, and that they ran with the crowd, and that there was no originality in seeking areas that had yet to be explored. Making new discoveries was very important. Now, this was perfect for the early years of space experimentation, it seemed to me, because the problems had to be very broadly based. The questions were not very precise. They were quite general. Someone said years later that, well, you've been up a hill. You're over the hill. And Professor Stewart's answer was, well, at least I've been up a hill, implying that the person making the criticism hadn't even been up one. That was the kind of person he was. And the idea that 
one should think big, was very fundamental. He had been in the Ministry of Aircraft Production during World War II in Britain, and I always used to joke that when he looked at a laboratory layout, he wouldn't say, well, let's move this bench here and that piece of equipment there. He'd start with saying, well, this wall should be removed, that wall should be removed, it should be replaced here and put there, and so on. He, he wasn't the kind of person who thought small. And I think this was very good experience, especially for a young investigator. Now, I spent a year at Cornell helping him close down his laboratory and moving it to Stony Brook. We had gotten him an appointment as a scholar in residence for a while. Ray Jones, who was English and had done a PhD at University of Newcastle under a very famous plant physiologist named Marion Thomas, who was a very good friend of F.C. Stewart's, said, look, we can certainly take advantage of his skills and knowledge and prestige, and that way we'll get the best of him in terms of what he can offer and what we can offer him. And it gave him a bit of a cushion for his retirement. He did not want to retire from Cornell. It was forced in that the age limit at that time was absolute. It was only after President Raisin, who was not a young fellow, decided that there was not going to be any mandated retirement. So here we are in a moving van. We moved much of the stuff from Cornell to Stony Brook. It made him feel better. It ended up providing stuff from which we could pick and choose. And along with that came the idea that the research project that I had been paid from, that had been made available to him through NASA Ames Research Center, that was to develop into the Cosmos flight experimentation started. So you can see that one doesn't just wake up and say, okay, we're going to do an experiment in space. We'll make a proposal, period. That may be the case now, but it certainly wasn't then. Of the several press releases to be found in the newspapers at that time, there's one in the Syracuse Herald American, November 1975, that was perhaps closest to being precise. Carrot cells to launch Cornell Emeritus co-designs test. That gave Professor Stewart a major role. Of course, it was deserved. I'm included in it. But the bottom line is, is that for local consumption in the Cornell area, Ithaca, he got very good press coverage. The test system that we'll talk about in much greater detail in the course of these several units is the totipotent carrot system. Now, at that time, the idea was that free cells could be induced to become or express their innate totipotency and go on and produce embryos or embryoids because they weren't sexually derived in a septic culture. The work actually had its origins at the University of Rochester where Professor Stewart was on the faculty in the Department of Biology. It was a fortuitous discovery that explants from the secondary phloem of cultivated carrot could grow in vitro, and if placed in liquid, peripheral cells could be sloughed off, and these in turn could be maintained in serial sequence. And when he moved to Cornell in 1950, that type of work continued. 
and it led eventually around 1956 or so to the discovery that when these cultivated cells were removed from liquid and placed on a semi-solid medium, they would develop into embryo-like structures and from these eventually through a series of graded steps develop into whole plants. Of course, at that time, this finding, which was new, attracted a great deal of attention. John Tremore, who was a NASA employee at Ames Research Center, told me some time later that he had seen a publication of Stewart's on totipotent carrot cells and had thought that it had excellent potential to be used in a flight experiment. John Tremor himself was interested in the development of amphibian and I think uh, frog eggs and other kinds of animal systems he was interested in science in addition to being what they call a more management type person. In any case, he had invited Professor Stewart to become one of the funded investigators through NASA, and that's how the connection was established. Now, when Stewart and I started thinking about the actual experiment, I raised the question, well, don't you think we should try to give much more rationale for why the experiment's being done using a more modern uh, explanation? For instance, should we talk about differential gene expression in the space environment and the like? Dr. Stewart was fairly adamant when he said, look, that's all window dressing. The real question is, are there any problems in the space environment? And if there are, we can begin to find out what they are. And if there aren't any, so be it. We can say the material flew, it came down, nothing happened, period. Now, of course, that type of mentality wouldn't have gone very far, it seems to me. So we had this kind of agreement that we wouldn't push the attempt to sound uh, too modern with differential gene expression and gene regulation. And of course now, that's all one's talking about. If you go into the area of visualizing all of this, Dr. Stewart used to emphasize in his lectures the so-called genetic, epigenetic landscape that Waddington in England was pushing. Here's a scheme that shows that you've got essentially differential gene expression and the environment and their interactions and that you can have something start at the top and take these various pathways. And if anything dramatic was going to happen, it could be expressed. I still find that a very attractive visual metaphor on all of this business of gene regulation anyways. Similarly, Paul Weiss had put out a very interesting diagram, which again, I liked very much, on the interactions in development according to uh, his views on how the gene and chromosome structure and the nucleus and the cytoplasm, tissue, organism, and the environment all could interact and have different levels of interaction as an organism proceeded in its developmental pathway. In other words, things were not simple and straightforward. Once again, the attractiveness of this kind of viewpoint was evident in a space flight experimental sequence using such a test system as the carrot. Now, there had been a fair amount of research done on biosatellites, 
In fact, there was a, a bibliography, which is not all that thin, that outlined some of the data. Well, the fact is that if you really examine it, the flights were very short duration. It wasn't a matter of having a long-term space flight that would yield specific information. Far to the contrary, they were very short flights. If you comb through the references, one can see bits and pieces of information that you can glean and learn that a number of observations had been made on things which had undergone spaceflight of shorter or longer duration. We won't bother reading through all of these. You can read them as well as I can read them to you. But one of the things that struck me was this business of the nucleus. For instance, multiple nuclei had been encountered. Chromosomal aberrations had been encountered, and so on. Now, this image is of considerable interest because it gives a proposed or projected timeline at the bottom in terms of the year, starting with 1950, going up to 2030. And the duration of the potential for flight is on the left-hand side going up to 10,000 days or longer. Space colonization was anticipated at 2030, a Mars base, a man Mars base, a lunar base, lunar laboratory, the space station, the STS system, which is the space transport system or shuttles, which are now defunct, of course, Salyut missions, Skylab, Apollo Soyuz, Gemini, Mercury, going back to the Russian or Soviet Sputnik. The extent to which each one of these was realized on schedule is something that we do not care to enter onto right now, but many would probably say that it's been a little bit slower in development than one had hoped. Nevertheless, that gives a nice overview of the potential and the aspirations for the big scheme. Now again, the scheme on all of this is very big, very grandiose. And as it turned out, 1975, some volumes entitled Foundations of Space Biology and Medicine came out. It was a joint publication uh, of the Americans and the Soviets. It was uh, edited very nicely, but the main emphasis really was the space environment as a habitat, care and feeding of astronauts, very detailed indeed. It was put out in English, and if I recall correctly, there was a series in Russian. The American editor was Melvin Calvin, professor at Berkeley who was well known for his work on photosynthesis, and Oleg Guzenko, who I got to know a bit. He was head of the Institute for Biomedical Problems in Moscow. I'm not sure if he was really head. He was even higher than that. It's the Institute for Biomedical Problems came under his supervision. Oleg Gazenko also had had a huge amount of experience in spaceflight development. In fact, in 1957, when Sputnik 2 was flown, there was a dog on board called Laika. Laika apparently had been a dog that they'd picked up on the streets of Moscow and had trained her among other dogs, but I guess she ended up being selected for flight. 
They sent her up on the Sputnik 2, and this the idea was that she would be a test organism to see whether or not space flight could be safe for humans. So she was a little bit of a uh, blockbuster, so to speak. Well, she died in flight, apparently. The Soviets at that time weren't coming totally clean on the outcome of the mission in terms of the dog. They claimed that she had died only after running out of oxygen, but many years later, somewhere in the early 2000s, they pointed out that she had died very early on, perhaps even as early as the first day of flight due to overheating. The pity is that in that period, the Soviets were more paranoid and highly secretive. I don't think that they're any more secretive than the Americans were, but nevertheless, there's probably a very interesting bit of information on all of that. Oleg Gazenko was a gentleman, I can vouch for that, and he was a credit to the field. He did a lot of good work and certainly managed a lot of good experimentation done by the Soviets. Now, there's no doubt, whatever, that there's far more sex appeal in the grandiose picture. The astronauts, of course, add a touch of glamour. The National Geographic coverage of this area in general over the years reflects that. This one here on the first Explorers on the Moon, about which much has been said and written. Another issue deals with the Soviets in space. Are they ahead? And so on. The answer to that is that in some ways they were ahead, in others they weren't. They have a totally different style of carrying out research, about which we'll say a bit more later. Return to Mars is on the cover of yet another National Geographic. So the public support for NASA programs, which is very high and has always been high, has been reflected in the grand picture. The Aeronautics and Space Museum in Washington apparently is the number one attraction getter in the DC area of all the museums. I'll say as an aside that Long Island has long had a substantial interest in the aerospace industry, and a couple of these artists' conceptions of research for such things as moon gardening and the like date from 1959 and 1960. Now, it seems appropriate to also mention that the various programs dealing with planetary affairs have always wanted to emphasize the value of their studies for understanding life. Here's a very attractive artist's conception of life, a product of cosmic, planetary, and biological processes. Again, very big picture, and one would ask whether or not they think the small biology that I'm going to be concentrating on really has much of a role to play in the big picture. We'll see that, indeed, it's a matter of competing uh, approaches to the study of life under low-gravity environments. Now, the amazing thing is that NASA has its own subculture. Years ago, one of the contractors, in this case, I guess it was Lockheed Martin, put out a booklet called List of Acronyms for Space Station Freedom. And I remember at one of the meetings, someone said MGH. I said, well, to me, MGH, coming from Massachusetts, means Mass General Hospital. He said, yeah, that's what it means in this, too. But the parlance, the vocabulary, was rather interesting. Iteration and reiteration was something that I added to my vocabulary through NASA involvement. An iteration meant that you could go through things again and again and again and again 
and all these iterations became reiterations. So that it was kind of amusing, and how many people have this handbook, I don't know. I've got a few copies. Perhaps they have done an updated version, I don't know. In connection with trying to come up with environments where one can live happily in space, one approach has been to investigate centrifuges on a very large scale. This has been undertaken by NASA, of course, where the centrifuges can accommodate full-grown human beings to slightly smaller ones, but nevertheless still large ones at facilities like the University of California at Davis, where people in the Department of Poultry Husbandry, uh, those individuals interested in avian eggs, have undertaken studies using large centrifuges. The idea is to investigate gravity in contrast to a response relationship. In other words, at what g does one get a given response? The use of centrifuges also is envisioned as providing an opportunity to have a control in space in low g environments, where you now have a control where it's 1g as on Earth. The possibility of uncovering threshold responses comes up, of course. And then there's the idea of how long can one tolerate living in altered G environments without having to resort to some kind of countermeasure. That is to say, provide various durations of artificial gravity as by means of a centrifuge to allow growth development and living to proceed. Here's an image of a very large centrifuge, courtesy of Dr. Chuck Fuller at UC Davis. You can see that it's very large indeed. These facilities are not trivial to operate. They're not inexpensive, and they're a major challenge to those who would seek to use them effectively. In a moment, we're going to see an image of clinostats. Now, clinostats do not eliminate gravity. They neutralize gravity. And you can see the scheme outline here showing the various kinds of clino-rotation, as one refers to it, to carry out investigations. I'll talk more about this later. Back in 1991, a symposium of great interest entitled Kleinostats and Centrifuges uh, was published in the American Society of Gravitational and Space Biology Bulletin, the ASGSB Bulletin. If one really wants a good overview of what these centrifuges and Kleinostats can deliver, it's important to study this document in substantial detail. It's a wealth of information. It's worth bringing your attention to a few examples from the rather old classical literature that suggests that gravity and lack of gravity or neutralizing gravity can have substantial effects on development. In this scheme, which is rather complicated, one need only point out that there is, in fact, abnormal development after displacement of germplasm by centrifugation. This was worked out in the early 1900s by Theodore Boveri. It deals with para ascaris equorum, which used to, in my day and age, be called ascaris megalocephala. Is that is one of the worms. If we look at the next slide, there's additional classical work dealing with the effects of ultracentrifugation on the development of the rhizoid from fertilized fucus eggs. You'll recall fucus is the brown alga genus. Stratification and displacement 
of the cytoplasm has significance for the location of the rhizoid emergence. And again, even though these are old questions, the questions remain the same. The techniques for studying them are more advanced, of course. Finally, as an interesting example from the classical botanical literature that deals with the development of a organism, one of the lower plants as it were, that talks about isoetes, embryo development, on a clinostat. And the conclusion drawn by the fellow who did these experiments, a man named Lamott, was that there is a short period beginning some 18 hours after fertilization during which the embryo can respond to the stimulus of gravity. And that after this period, there can be no change in the regular course of developmental orientation until after bending of the leaf and root occurs. It's also worth pointing out that in the case of isoetes, the, the egg is in fact not in direct connection with the sac in which it is located. It's not firmly fixed, and this may in fact have another role to play. We'll bring it up quite a lot later in this discussion. I want to switch gears here a little bit and emphasize that the United States was a bit late getting into the field of experimentation so far as biology was concerned. In 1967, Biosatellite 2 was a fairly ambitious effort. It was not a very successful flight in that it was very short duration. Things had to be shortened considerably. The detailed experiments were published and we'll see here that they were put out in an attractive format, and these are still worth looking at. The editor of the volume was Joe Saunders, was from NASA headquarters, and whether the volume is still available, I'm not sure. It certainly must be in some of the depository libraries. The fact that the flight was so short really caused a great deal of consternation because, of course, you can't really start interpreting what went on or why it happened. Now, the reports of Biosatellite 2, just mentioned, were published in 1971. And I think it is worth saying that there were several experiments dealing with the culture of animal cells. Some of the machinery and the gadgetry and the equipment and the flight apparatus to be used is rather sophisticated. It was pretty tailor-made, and here's an example of one of the models that was a candidate. This actually never flew itself, but it was set up in a very nice way. Unfortunately, there was a lot of what I call spaghetti tuning. Uh, Tigon tubing that had potential for air bubbles and so on. But by using animal cells fixed on a surface, attached as it were, one could make a lot of sophisticated observations. So this means that the development of hardware, some of it quite advanced, started quite early in the game. The costing of these things was probably a mere fraction of what later developments ended up costing. Now, what that means, I don't know. But it means that in this case, the questions posed in a given experiment were then adapted in such a way that a piece of hardware was developed to accommodate them. It wasn't a matter of having a piece of hardware and then being told, now you can use this. What can you do using this given piece of hardware? It's a completely different approach to how one should design an experiment. So I think it's worth saying that here we are, 1971 and earlier, designing quite nice, small, compact pieces of apparatus for use in flight. 
This here is a museum piece. I happen to have picked it up when we were trying to figure out how to approach instrument design for growing plant cells. Uh, these were not applicable to our needs, but I felt the need to introduce this here as an aside. It was only until 1981 that the United States felt that it was in a position to showcase its nominal achievements, and some stamps were put out. Of course, things started going as a result of the reaction to the Sputniks that were put up in the 50s. I mentioned Oleg Gazenko and his involvement with the early experiments with animals to see whether or not they could be used as precursor investigations for the prospect of using space for human habitation. On the other hand, in Russia, they'd gone through a fair amount of trouble to showcase their achievements. And there's a big park in Moscow that was showcasing the so-called the Park of Soviet Achievements. And it's quite an interesting place, not anywhere near as glitzy as our Disney World or Disneyland, but nevertheless much more geared towards instruction and teaching the public. And here is an image that I took in July of 1975 that, that shows some of the, the models that were actually used. Now, Russian rocketry was apparently more advanced than our own, even though our rocketry started things off. And as so often happens, others run with the ball. Now, we've given a very superficial overview and I don't pretend that it's chronologically correct in all of the exactness, but it certainly is sufficient to give a perspective from my personal viewpoint, at least. Now, one thing we want to do is to get onto the track that we started with, namely of doing an experiment on the Soviet Cosmos series more particularly Cosmos 782. It's worth saying once again that the Soviet system utilizes institutes for concentrating specific disciplines. Now we have institutes in America and Europe has its own institutes, but the university system here with its departmental structure is usually a lot more uh, geared to the individual investigator. Uh, more and more groups are assembling in institutes, but in the USSR, quite early on, they decided that they would have foci or focal points for given disciplines. In this instance, this is an overview of the K. A. Tamiryazev Institute for Plant Physiology. Tamiryazev was a well-known plant physiologist who worked with photosynthesis and was really quite a pioneer. But so they've named this institute after him. And the Tamiryazev is the prestigious premier institution for doing plant physiology, development, genetics, morphogenesis, uh, molecular biology studies. Dr. Stewart had gone in late 1961 to India as part of a UNESCO convened and funded symposium on plant cell tissue and organ culture, which was just coming into its own in what might be called the modern era. He went spent time in Delhi, where he actually had a, a postdoc visitor and it had a good friend in the form of the chairman of the Department of Botany, a very distinguished Indian botanist named Maheshwari. 
He stayed there. There was a small group of very able investigators who were the fathers of plant cell culture, I might say. People like Reinert and Stewart's former student, uh, H.E. Street, Jean Nitsch from Paris, and a few others of that caliber. On his way back from India to the United States, he had been asked by the Royal Society of London, of which he was a member, to stop by in Moscow to give some lectures, which he did do. This was somewhere maybe early January 1962. And it was on that occasion that he became known on a personal level to some of the Soviet investigators. Now, the Soviet investigators that he came in contact with for the first time face to face were those who he had known from the literature. The director of the institute was a fellow named Kursanov. Uh, Kursanov was a uh, well known for his early work on translocation in plants, and a fellow Chailachian, Mikhail Kristoforovich Chailachian, who was an ethnic Armenian working in Moscow. He worked on plant growth and development, especially uh, in the area of flowering and flowering hormones, as it were. And one of the associates at the Institute then was a youngish woman, Raisa Georgievna Butenko. Here she is on the left-hand side of this photograph, the third from the left. Uh, on the very far right in profile is a fellow named Smirnov. He was the associate director of the Institute. So this picture was taken in 1962, and we'll use that as a point of departure for a few more comments as we go along with the idea of how this business of the liaison evolved. Now the talks that FCS gave in Delhi and in Moscow focused on the work with cultured carrot and the effect of various growth regulators on the growth, followed by the sloughing off of cells from the periphery of these carrot explants and their continued development into somatic embryos, or as they were termed then, embryoids. The work was published in the American Journal of Botany in late 1958, but it was well advertised considerably earlier for several years. He went and lectured here, there, and everywhere. In fact, one colleague said, is there anyone anywhere who hasn't heard these lectures on carrots and coconut? Well, the fact is that his friend Ralph Wetmore, who was a well-known morphologist at Harvard, said, look, Camp, you better get some of this stuff published because there's too many people starting to pick up on the threads. Well, one of the threads was being picked up, unbeknownst to Stewart, in Moscow by who we later came to call Madame Butenko, or Butenka, as they would say in Russian. She had read the papers very carefully and had set up an operation that was remarkably similar to the one that existed at Cornell, the complete with rotating apparatus. They had a massive team working on the culture of plant cells and tissues. That was one of the things that was very noticeable in the Soviet system, is that you had hot and cold running servants and technicians, as I put it. So you could do a lot of work. Anything that was labor intensive was fine. You had plenty of hands to carry out the various and sundry operations. Well, Madame Butenko had pioneered this area in Russia and had had quite a few students over the years. And by the time I came to meet her, 
she was a very well-established scientist, a corresponding member of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. She wasn't yet a full member, but she was a charming woman, and anyone and everyone who met her was taken by her outward and pleasant personality. She was fluent in a few languages, so there was no problem whatever in communicating with her. The following images of Professor Stewart and his close associate, Marion Mapes, and a fellow who was finishing his PhD at Cornell in cytogenetics named uh, Jody Mitra, who later became a professor of biology at New York University in Manhattan, are shown in this particular picture. And you can see the proposed scheme from going from a single cell through the various stages, yielding a full uh, plantlet or plant of carrot, even to the extent of flowering and making uh, mature storage roots with the cultivated carrot at least. The Russians were quite good at setting up uh, public relations type documentation, again for educating the public, and here's an interesting scheme here that covers a host of things. One of the things that I thought was interesting is that Madame Butenko and her colleagues were trying to do uh, syntheses, biosyntheses of compounds as from the Siberian ginseng, Eleutherococcus. Uh, I had had an interest in biosynthetic potentialities of cultured plant cells, about which I'll say a bit later, but uh, it was really right up my alley to see what they were doing. By 1975, she had published a few works that were noteworthy and that they were good summaries, and they even uh, got translated into English by the what was then called the Israel Translation Service. And the schemata that she presents are indeed very reminiscent of the ones that were extant in the botanical literature emanating from Stewart's lab in that early period. Now, I want to mention that my own early interest wasn't really so much in the morphogenetic competence in terms of development, but it was a matter of uncoupling development and getting the biochemistry without the morphogenesis. The idea was to use un morphogenetically expressed cells, that is to say cells that were growing more or less like microorganisms or chains of microorganisms, and doing their biochemistry that would normally be encountered in an intact root or an intact leaf or in a various part of a plant, such as a glandular hair or whatever. Well, this turned out not to be uh, as easy as one had hoped, and I'll comment on that in a little bit later, but we had to put my biochemical differentiation work on the back burner to take up a study of morphogenesis from free cultured cells. So it wasn't a matter of learning all over again, but it was a matter of becoming more sophisticated in the methodology because prior to that time when it fell into my hands, the emphasis was much more general, morphogenetically uh, specialized, but not all that quantitative. Uh, measurements of growth by weight and so forth were done, but counting, staging, the like had yet to be developed. And more importantly, all of the work had been done in liquid and on a few occasions, some of it was continued on the surface of agar. So we'll see that we had to take the whole system and adapt it and develop it. And it was no trivial task taking the fundamentals and then making it work like a system. Now, I don't want to get too much ahead of myself. I should backtrack a little bit. In the latter part of 1971, November to be exact, I made my way to India from the west coast of the United States through Hawaii, stopping in Japan, 
Bangkok, Thailand, if I recall correctly, and then India. I'd been invited to a conference on organ culture. And the interesting thing is that the people who attended this meeting were what you could probably call the second generation of those pioneers that I mentioned earlier in the 1961 at the UNESCO-sponsored meeting in Delhi, co-sponsored by the Department of Botany with Professor Panchanan Maheshwari, a chairman and a UNESCO representative. This particular meeting in Delhi was a very excellent one, as a matter of fact, even though it was small. Among the foreign visitors were myself and a couple of the younger people, uh, slightly older than me, however. One of them was Walter Halperin, who had been a graduate student with Don Wetherill at the University of Connecticut and had taken a job recently at the University of Washington in Seattle. A fellow named Graham Henshaw, who was at the University of Birmingham, who had been a graduate student with Herbert Street, who I'd mentioned earlier again, one of Stewart's early graduate students in London. Along with those members, Americans as it were, were some foreign delegates from the Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc of the USSR, as it were. Raisa Georgievna Butenka was one of the guests. And Smirnov, who again we pointed out earlier in the 1961 picture, or early 1962, whatever it was, photograph, at the Timiryazev, was there. I'm not quite sure what he was there for. Frequently, the Soviets used to send out what were termed watchdogs to make sure that guests had been, who had been sent abroad behaved themselves, apparently. But in any case, there were a few other people, one of them who was a student of very well-known Czech plant physiologist named Nimich, and a few others who I'll mention briefly. But it was nice meeting these people. They were all quite interesting. They'd had good backgrounds. And all in all, the weather was perfect, and it turned out to be uh, an excellent meeting. Now, the funny thing is, here I am 10 years later, or slightly more than 10 years later, at the same place, meeting the Russians at a scenario that involved cell and tissue culture. It was not a coincidence, or maybe it was a coincidence, but whatever it was, it was a happy set of circumstances because I became uh, very familiar with Madame Butenko. We hit it off straight away and smeared off the same way. And I might say that I got to know Georges Merrell very well because they had made us roommates at the Science Center uh, in Delhi that had been fairly recently opened. So all in all, it was a really interesting uh, exposure for me. In fact, when Stewart heard that I was invited, he was pleased and said, well, you'll have a good time. The Indians will look after you very well. And indeed, they did. Now. This was a good opportunity for me to renew friendships with H.Y. Mohan Ram and his wife Manasi. And Manasi, we'll see later, was a very charming, nice woman. She died rather early after a stroke. But Mohan is still alive and functioning. He was a leading figure in Indian botany. He became chairman of the Department of Botany at University of Delhi. He was very well connected politically, and he had a knack for understanding how plants work. He really loved plants, as did Manasi. And I think it was interesting to me that they 
approach plants from the perspective of everything you could think of. Anatomy, morphology, taxonomy, biochemistry, genetics. They had a very broad interest and deep understanding of some of the more esoteric plants, but at the same time, some of the more important ones. As I will mention, they worked with Stewart on a United Fruit funded project that dealt with uh, bananas. Now, I don't think it was an accident that I got invited to participate in a symposium at the Botanical Congress, the, I think it was the 12th Botanical Congress, in what was then Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, of course. I was invited to participate in a I guess it was a growth and differentiation symposium, and I presented some of the data on the biochemical differentiation and synthesis of secondary products. The paper was generally well received, except I got into a little bit of a scrap with some East German plant biochemists who were not very happy with the conclusion that I had drawn, namely, the syntheses that had been achieved thus far by everyone, including me, had been minimal and in many cases different from what the intact plant organ or structure was identified as making. I was at that time doing experiments on altering the environment, the culture nutrient medium and the environment to which cells were being exposed to see that, in fact, manipulating the medium had a fairly substantial role to play on uh, what these cells would produce. The main thing was that you had to starve these cells to get them to behave. Now, you ran into a catch-22. You starve the cells and you can't get them to grow so then you have to worry about pulsating the cultures. Well, in any case, the Germans had to sit back and Kurt Mottis, who was the symposium convener, a very well-known East German professor who had done a lot of work on secondary metabolism, especially nitrogen compounds like alkaloids in higher plants. And, and he sided with me, and that seems to have kept some of the others at bay. But we need not go into that very much. But again, being in Russia in 1975 served a double purpose, because NASA had been involved in working out relationships with the Americans and others, I might say, Russia was really reaching out uh, like a big brother to uh, a lot of countries, offering them opportunities to interact with Russian scientists and others. So they were really networking rather widely. I think a lot of this was political, but that was all right. Now, Professor Stewart and I went to the Congress and we had a good time. Mrs. Stewart was with him. And the idea was that while there, we would go from Leningrad to Moscow. Well, as it turned out, when the meeting was about to end, we were told that we better leave Russia or leave the USSR, that we hadn't had permission to proceed to Moscow. Well, the idea there didn't rest very well with Professor Stewart. And he said to me, he said, now looky here, these people are behaving, are really behaving very badly. You've got to get on the phone with Larry Chambers. Well, Larry Chambers worked at NASA headquarters. and He was a very fine, highly efficient fellow. I mean, I've, he was on top of everything. And I called him taking into account the time difference. 
And the next thing you knew, we had permission to go on to Moscow. So we got on a plane and we went. And when we reached Moscow, we were given the royal treatment. A car had been sent for him and me, two different Volga limousines, complete with driver, chauffeur, if you will. And we were, from that point onwards, given the VIP treatment. They were very apologetic that the paperwork had somehow not gotten caught up and that we were even temporarily put in the situation of perhaps realizing that we couldn't go on to Moscow. Mention has already been made of the Soviet system in which institutes are set up and end up being the focal point for various activities. Well, as it turns out, the Institute for Biomedical Problems handled all of the biology associated with spaceflight. The subsidiary institution about which I'll say a little bit more, the Timiryazev that I've already told you about and shown a picture of, was in fact subsidiary to this particular one. So the first place we met was the Institute for Biomedical Problems and Oleg Gazenko at the head of the table here on the far right was the main person who handled the initial things. The translator at the time was a, a Russian woman with the name of Mary Williams of all things. Apparently Mary Williams's father was an Englishman. I'm going to quickly go through some slides that show some high points of the discussions. Here's Dr. Gazenko again on the right, Mary Williams and Professor Stewart and myself on the left. The meetings went very well. I took a lot of notes, others took notes, and in all in all, it ended up being very informative. We got first-hand idea of what it's all about. And it was rather pleasant and informal, even though there was a very formal structure to it all. We felt comfortable, they felt comfortable with us, and I think it was all in all a, a good situation where we didn't feel like foreigners and we couldn't have been better received as mentioned earlier. We were given a really elegant tour of the operations and you'll see here a couple of them. Here's Dr. Gazenko again on the right. We're looking into some of these hyperbaric chambers and saw many of the operations. We ended up ultimately at the Tamiryazev. Here's a picture of academician Chailachian on the left, the director of the Institute Kursanov in the middle, and me on the right. Dr. Kursanov's English wasn't too great, but on occasion he'd speak German with me. Chailachian, of course, was fluent in English, he spoke Armenian, and it was pleasant for him and me both that he knew my Armenian roots and we could converse because he really spoke Western Armenian, not the Eastern Soviet type Armenian. So that was good. And I might also say that uh, I established a very good rapport with him and met in a very interesting way some of his good friends that used to go back and forth to Russia. Here's a picture of Anton Lang, uh, who became the director of the Atomic Energy Commission Plant Research Lab at Michigan State. There they are in the greenhouse at the Tamiryazev working together. He was a guest of academician Chailachian's on a number of occasions, and when I used to go to their house, I would frequently encounter him. I ended up doing a number of things that Charlachian appreciated immensely, and that was I shepherded through the press a couple of fairly massive publications that were summaries of his research. Now, of course, his research on plant flowering hormones was well known, but there weren't too many 
places where he had pulled it together in English. And this was an opportunity. We did it in an article in the Botanical Review, which had a mini biography and a nice picture of him that I put in. And then there was another one where is a special paper in the American Journal of Botany that pulled together a great amount of it. So this helped him and it really was much appreciated. He kept on saying, you've done a very big thing for me. So that was nice. So again, we have a number of sort of contacts that were more than just casual and so on. Madame Butenko, of course, is seen in this picture with Professor Stewart. She's drinking tea. She was an avid tea drinker. She was, the, the Russians all had tea breaks all day long. But uh, there she is. And uh, again, she couldn't have been more cordial. And it was nice that we were going to be doing an experiment that she was very familiar with the system. And uh, we didn't have to explain much to her, and she was going to take it from there. Now, the design of the experiment was handled, of course, by Dr. Stewart and myself. That was no problem. We discussed it, and everything seemed to be okay on that front. So far as the laboratory manipulations were concerned, I relied very heavily on Ron Dutcher, who we see here on the right. Frank Ronald Dutcher, he didn't like Frank, so he'd go by F. Ronald. But Ron was a very able student. He did his undergraduate at Stony Brook, and he did a master's with me. Elizabeth Yim on the left, Elizabeth Takwong Yim, who was born in Macau, but was a Cornell undergraduate, was my technician, very able woman. She ended up going to Hong Kong with her husband, who was a PhD from the University of Wisconsin in geography, if I remember right. Elizabeth ended up taking a PhD and was on the staff of the University of Hong Kong, and she has recently retired, so you get an idea of how long ago much of this was. But in any case, they were a real good team. They worked hard. They were very able, and I can't say enough for either of them. Ron went on to become a, an associate in uh, Washington, D.C., working with Thora Halstead through NASA at George Washington University on their various and sundry databases. His wife, who was also an undergraduate at Stony Brook, ended up being fairly high in the National Library of Medicine set up. In Moscow, the right-hand man or right-hand woman, as it were, of Raisa Butenka was Natasha Dmitrieva, a very, very nice lady, a girl, who was on top of everything, and Madame Butenko depended on her, no doubt, more than anybody for all of her activities and supervision of the lab. Natasha and I hit it off very well, and I got the royal tour of the botany establishment in Moscow. Not only did I get a regular tour, it was a tailor-made tour. Things were set up in such a way that I was the only guest or tourist, as it were, at any of these institutions. The Botanic Garden, which I always thought was an interesting place, ended up being even more interesting when I found out that the setup in Russia at that time was such that in the interest of employing almost everyone or everyone, almost every plant had its caretaker. It was amazing. You'd say, though, well, this is my plant, and you'd have one person who would look after it. So the idea of seeing what was going on in detail and getting a privileged behind the scenes operation, the Botanic Garden was magnificent, really, quite elegant. Here's a winter scene that gives you an idea of how nice and quiet and well looked after things really are or were. <laughs>
Now we want to direct our attention to some of the flight particulars. The first thing is to point out a rather interesting first day cover that was made available to me and a copy to Professor Stewart by Dick Simmons, Richard C. Simmons from then at NASA Ames Research Center, Moffett Field, who later became a dean of veterinary medicine at the University of Nevada, a very fine fellow. He said, Abe, the attached special cachet is a small token of thanks for me for your support and help during the COSMOS 782 mission. You will note that the postmark coincides with a flight milestone. And of course what he's referring to is that the stamp is the December 15th in the morning at 1975, the day of recovery. The launch for the COSMOS was the 25th of November 1975 and the joint US USSR biological satellite program logo on the left is attractive. The stamp it says is an Apollo Soyuz stamp put out in America. It was a US 10 cent stamp. I don't know if I have any copies of that, but nevertheless, there were only 178 of the first day covers uh, issued. 24 of them were damaged during printing in terms of the emblem at least. So it's rare indeed, and of course they never did print any additional ones. But it's quite attractive, and again in keeping with the business of showcasing and so forth. Now the next picture is of the Biosputnik, written out in English of course, and on the other end, Biosputnik in Russian, indicating cell division, and rats and the biosatellite. Very attractive and quite timely. There were a number of little pins put out in the USSR at that time, perhaps even now. They were very pin conscious and there were many, many pins put out. This one is not in the very best shape, but it's 1975 and it's in Biosputnik Cosmos 782. So this too is probably rare. Now, we knew, as everyone else knew, that under ideal circumstances, one would want to carry out what eventually came to be called a seed-to-seed -seed experiment. Namely, you plant a seed, it germinates, it flowers, it gets pollinated, fertilizes the egg, and you get another seed, and then you plant it and go through the cycle. Well, that was a very ambitious project, and it wasn't going to happen for quite a few years later. But the alternative was to take advantage of our special interests and the fact that limited space would be made available, and also the accommodation wasn't going to be highly sophisticated. It would have to be carried out in darkness and so on. This scheme on the left-hand side shows the normal sexual pathway from a diploid somatic tissue type thing going down to the diploid embryo. After fertilization, it shows lower down Lower down, it shows a male gamete fertilizing, and then you get a diploid uh, zygote. The alternative pathway, which entails somatic cells, in other words, not sexual cells, sometimes called adventitious embryony or apospory or apospory, and some of the other alternatives, is essentially the category into which the somatic cell embryogenesis system of the carrot can fall. So it was a way, so far as we were concerned, of uh, doing a experiment using cell cultures, which had its own advantages, but also allowing some kind of comparison as to what might happen in the environment should a plant be grown. Recognizing fully, however, that in the embryo sac, a fertilized egg is highly protected 
whereas in the petri dish environment, cells were less so. And we saw that as being both an advantage and a disadvantage, but uh, so be it. The growth of free cells in embryogenesis, of course, had its origins, as mentioned earlier, at the Cornell Laboratory. It was largely done in liquid at that time, or on the agar surface, as I said. And if one takes a look at this picture, which dates from a fairly early period, you can see that stages of carrot embryogenesis could be pulled out, selected from liquid. And of course, these were grown in the light. And again, I had mentioned earlier, we had to adapt this business to darkness, try to get some semi-synchrony, and to take it from there. Now, I don't expect anyone's going to be able to read this thing in great detail. It's been reproduced from the paper in 1975 from the Royal Society Transactions. But the cycling of cells through various stages and having the cells be at what Dr. Stewart used to like to refer to as poised for their further development came to be the hallmark of our approach to the whole thing. The idea was to prepare cells in such a way that we would have them poised, whatever that meant, to further development, but to arrest the development on Earth after preparation so that when the material was sent up on the biosatellite, it would continue its development, if it could, and we thought it should, and that turned out to be the case. But we had to wrestle with the idea of what to do to arrest the development and keep poised cells in their poised but non-progressing state. So the approach was that we should try the idea of cold. Now, largely in deference to my kind of wishing to be slightly uh, up to date, we used the words morphological determinants. And one of the papers that emerged came out with the title, Is Gravity a Morphological Determinant in Plants at the Cellular Level? Now, whether that really ended up being more clear than an alternative title, I'm not able to say, but it was certainly, for me, a, a good title. Now, the management of the system from which cell preparations were to be made was not easy. Ordinarily, it's bad enough doing the cell culture work. It's rather labor intensive. To have things in a state of readiness for continued processing became even more difficult at Stony Brook at the time for the following reason. The old biology building in which we, quote, resided, end quote, was going to be vacated, and moves were in process and in progress to the new Life Sciences Building, a very nice large structure. Well, the accommodations that we were to get in the Life Sciences Building were quite substantial and handsome, as it were, and had great potential. But we were afraid to do aseptic work in an untested facility. Dr. Stewart, in particular, had said, look, it's like a ship. You need a shakedown operation to make sure that everything works. And to put things at risk and move into a new building without adequate time to settle into it and to see that things could be made to work was very unwise indeed. So we stayed in the old biology building. It was the, we were the last people to move out. And in the process of doing that, we had to really adapt to a lot of unwelcome situations. For instance, the 
air conditioning and so on, we had to improvise these things on an ad hoc basis. We did, in fact, pull it off. But I mention this, that it's, it's not just a simple, straightforward procedure, even at the management level, because it would take a small army to have these cultures growing in nipple flasks on this rotating apparatus. The incline was about five degrees, and many people liked the idea of thinking that this was a clinostat. Well, it was rotating apparatus, and Professor Stewart had mentioned to me that when he was at Rochester, David Goddard, who was a very distinguished plant physiologist, his predecessor at the University of Rochester, had said, look, this thing really needs a name. So they named it an oxophyton, but no one used the name except once or twice. And I'll just throw in as an aside in, in our next unit, we'll say that uh, Dr. Goddard was Alan Brown's colleague at the University of Pennsylvania. In fact, he helped recruit Alan from Minnesota to the University of Pennsylvania. Now, the rotating apparatus, one of several, because we had three chambers like this going night and day, they're continuous, they don't rest at all, was the source of our cell materials. The cultures that we use were not from cultivated carrot. I had done work and we saw that the synchrony was going to be a little bit better achievable using wild carrot, the Queen Anne's lace. Why that was so, I don't know. I didn't know then and I still don't know. But the point is that the stamen base of the wild carrot served as the origin of the wild carrot cultures that we ended up using. Now the filtration of cells, as we called it, was only then coming into being. In fact, the filtrations that we carried out at Cornell were rather crude, and I more or less refined these with time. But here's a diagrammatic representation of the procedures that we followed in the filtration of the cultured cells that came from suspension as to unit size. And then what, having achieved the proper cell size, we'd then end up putting these through the paces and dispersing them in agar medium at a warmish temperature, let's say baby bottle warm, about 48 to 52 degrees centigrade or Celsius, so that you didn't hurt the cells with any heat, but yet you kept the agar from congealing. And then they'd be dispersed, as we can see in the lower left, into five mils of medium into plastic Petri dishes which were then just being developed into snap-tight lid dishes. So we didn't have to wrap these things with parafilm, making all the more work. Now this plate composite shows a general view of cells taken from suspension of the wild carrot, as I said, after successive stages of filtration. So the top layer shows material as it's gone through a couple of layers of cheesecloth. And then the next level shows it having gone through sieves, stainless steel sieves, about uh, 140 micrometers in pore size, what we call a number 100 mesh sieve. And then the bottom was after passage through a number 200 mesh sieve of 74 micrometers pore size. So we're going from larger to smaller. Now, we show a few additional pictures to show that we had to go through quite a few manipulations to ascertain the best kind of culture, the best stage, and the 
time course it would take for these things to develop. This here is one of our early preparations that's quite an elegant one actually for the standards of the day that show a large number of developing embryos. We were able to plate these under different conditions. You can see here the different levels of development and how everything looks different depending on what we did and how we did it. So you've got to pick and choose. And this here is an even more interesting plate from my perspective in that it emphasizes the role of temperature on these things. So on the left-hand side, you've got pretreatment in days at low temperature, starting with the upper left, which is zero. In the days of subsequent treatment at 22 at the upper level, which is a more normal permissive temperature. And you can see on the left-hand side, you can keep these things pretty cool for a period of time. Now, the growth shown in each dish was the outcome of the number of days at 4 degrees C in the vertical scale, followed by the number of days at 22 on the horizontal scale, and that you could keep these things not very advanced for as long as 28 days, during which there was no progression of growth. It did not interfere with the ability of the cells to develop, though, when they were transferred to higher temperatures. So this was very good. We had a method now of keeping things arrested with a simple test, not using chemicals, low temperature. And of course, this gave rise to a number of people becoming interested in low temperature storage. I gave a talk at the New York Botanical Garden uh, on one occasion where more than a few people were very interested in this low temperature uh, observation. So we may have had more spin out on that account than I, I actually uh, might have anticipated. Now the dishes as prepared were inserted into these acrylic tubes. And when we come to the motion picture portion of this towards the end of our presentation, you'll see the elegant, delicate, deliberate work on the part of Ron Dutcher and Liz Yim, now Mrs. Joseph Lau, these dishes into the acrylic cylinder and putting them in such a way that you have what was termed a micro sill standoff that was a kind of cushioning that would just keep these dishes from banging on the side of the tube. There was a maximum minimum temperature recorder that we could see at the upper left. Then there was a HEPA filter put in there that would uh, keep any filth out as it were, not knowing what the environment would be. And then an aluminum or aluminum end cap, which was screwed on. It had openings through which air could pass. And I'll say also that the tightening of these things, although they did them in the laboratory at Stony Brook, by the time they got to California, where the finishing touches were put on, they actually used a very special kind of torque wrench to tighten them in a very scientific manner so that we knew that the tightening had nothing to do with anything that might actually happen. Now we've seen how the canister is loaded with petri dishes, and we'll actually again see this actually being done in the film portion. Just by way of reference, the tube itself was based on a design using a Campbell's tomato soup can. That was how it came into being. But it was, of course, very well cushioned. And it was beautiful for a number of reasons, including the fact that it was very simple and straightforward, nothing overly sophisticated. The centrifuge that I think we've mentioned much earlier on was a, a real boon in the sense that 
the whole business of being able to load these things into a canister so they could go onto the, the machine itself later is shown here. I won't go into detail on the axes of rotation and so forth, but all of that is accessible and available. We ran, at the time, simultaneous controls at Stony Brook and at Ames Research Center, and we used kleinostats. A very cute kleinostat was developed so that the Petri dishes inserted into the tube, the acrylic tube, plexiglass, if you will, and these would rotate, very smooth action. We weren't really sure what we were doing, but the idea was that a kleinostat could be valuable, so we got some experience with that. These acrylic tubes are empty, of course, but it gives a viewer an idea of how they were set up. If you turn it on its other axis, i.e. upright, you'll have a vertical versus a horizontal kleinostat. Now the centrifuge that was set up apparently had been used by the Soviets quite a few times. And the design, again, was rather simple and straightforward. We will see a view a little later on, I believe, where the fitting of it into the biosatellite will become evident. Now, the lower part of this page contains a lot of information in these three diagrams. And I'll just say that, to begin with, the sketches give a fair amount of important information as to the location of the flight packet with the petri dishes and the location of the control on the centrifuge. We'll need to focus in on these a bit closer so that we can really see. It's kind of small where it is. This diagrammatic representation shows the centrifuge in profile. The X represents the axis of rotation of the centrifuge. The little box labeled 2 represents the container which held the canister of nine Petri dishes at 1G control on the centrifuge. 4, on your lower right in the diagram, represents the same type of sample on a stationary platform underneath the rotating centrifuge with the zero G or near zero G control. So here we have the one G at the top in number two going around the centrifuge to give you a one G control. And at the bottom where it's underneath the rotating centrifuge, that is the real experimental package at number four, i.e. low G or micro G or hypo G, which we erroneously referred to or optimistically referred to at the outset as zero gravity. But you can see that it's quite ingenious in that they've used a relatively small space to do the centrifugation and also to have the flight samples exposed very close by. Now the next diagram gives you a view of the rotating centrifuge as seen from above. Our carrot cell somatic embryogenesis experiment, K102, is seen here on the bottom. The 1G centrifuge location was shared with an experiment called K104 that dealt with killifish development and embryogenesis. The investigators were Keefe and Bill Scheld and a couple of others, including Jane Oppenheimer, who had done some of the classic anatomy of fungulus, which is the genus fungulus, uh, in the 1930s, she was viewed as the expert on the 
development. We'll see her picture a little bit further on. But that's who we shared the block with. Now, the thing that's really interesting here is in this view, we can see on the axis 0.3 g. Now, I'm not sure who took up that spot. There's another one on the upper left, 0.6 g. These constitute what's referred to as a variable g capability. So one would, if one had the material right at dead center, where you see the little small Greek w, that would be 0 g. You could achieve 0.3 g if you position things at that location or at the outermost rim, as it were, where our K102 was, 1 g. But we would not have access to those, and it's a pity because one could really start finding out what was going on or could make some good comparisons. But that's the way it was. Now, this diagram shows in surface view the stationary platform with container number four that had nine petri dishes of carrot cells in it that were exposed to near zero G. That was our test sample. All this emphasizes that experimentation of substantial proportions could be carried out in a relatively small space. All of this information, of course, was handed on to us by the people who managed this, the individuals at Ames Research Center, very fine people. In fact, I'll make the general statement now that in all of our experiences, the activities at all of the centers, some more than others perhaps because we had a, a closer association with them, but Ames Research Center and then later at Kennedy Space Center, one couldn't really come across more dedicated, able public servants, people who knew what they were doing, did it gracefully, graciously, efficiently, etc. I can't say enough for these people, and I'm sure they're not anywhere near as well appreciated as they ought to be. Now, the next image is an artist's conception of the liftoff of the biosatellite on a Vostok rocket. As mentioned, we weren't at the site of liftoff. Liftoff apparently was routinely done through the facility at Plesetsk, which, if memory serves me right, was in Kazakhstan. The detachment of the biosatellite from the rocket is shown, and through various stages, on the far right, we see it around 3 o'clock, we see the descent of the biosatellite as recovered by a parachute. Now, the interesting thing is, among many interesting little points, is that the parachute recovery sometimes was more of a problem than at other times. And on one of the flights that we'll talk about considerably later, apparently the parachute came down under very bad weather conditions and there were lots of wolves around, lots of packs of wolves, that created their own problems so that the recovery was more than just a routine event. But the recovery site was outfitted with some rather imaginative, extending, articulated van-type vehicles, which were laboratories on wheels. And one image here shows an actual photograph sideways and a line diagram of the actual vehicle. The image here of the biosatellite contains a cutaway view of the centrifuge with the rats, etc. 
Apparently, in some of the operations at the recovery site, dissections, etc., of the rats occurred right then and there. Very large teams of investigators on site. Our material was recovered and returned to the Timirzev Institute of Plant Physiology in Moscow. Now, we've taken the trouble with all of the data made available to us. It was a very, very detailed timeline. But this graph shows diagrammatically the time course of events, emphasizing the temperature of the canisters throughout the entire experiment. The first small arrow pointing downwards, if your eyes are good enough to pick it up, at November 19th represents the actual date of preparation of the cells. The next arrow pointing upwards November 25th represents the liftoff of the flight. The third arrow, pointing downwards again, represents landing, which was, as we've said, December 15th. And the fourth, again downwards, the actual delivery of the flight materials at the Timuryazev Institute of Plant Physiology in Moscow. The arrow Downwards at December 21 represents the delivery of the synchronous ground controls, so-called capital K, capital F, dash 5 and 6, to the Timiryazev Institute. The very last arrow pointing downwards at December 22 represents the day when observation began at Stony Brook on material brought from the USSR as well as the synchronous ground controls from Ames Research Center and Stony Brook. So there you have it. There's a great deal of information on this. It was good that it gave an idea of the liftoff shown by the rocket, the Aleutian rocket going up, the Biocosmos satellite coming down on a parachute. Pretty good controls, basically, considering the very modest technique used to keep the temperature under control in these big black biotransporters. We'll see the biotransporters later again, the real ones, in the film. Now, we got a fair amount of good press coverage at that time. And we won't spend time reading these things, but we'll flip through a few. The New York Times, the Long Island newspapers uh, that were carrying on about Long Island carrots are in space shot. But it was significant because they were, as one of them said, a first in outer space. The cooperation that made this possible was significant. We were pioneers to the extent that no one else had done it. The idea that we could do a fair amount of research in a tiny space, in a small package, in a, in a Soviet satellite was, was, I think, very significant. Now, again, I've mentioned that we made a lot of friends, met new people. Here's a picture of a very fine woman Professor, the late Professor Jane Oppenheimer, or as the Russians referred to as Oppengeimer because they don't use H or H. So here's Jane Oppengeimer, a very well-known embryologist. She taught for many years at the Bryn Mawr College in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, not too far from Philadelphia. She had been brought in as a, uh, I guess she had been brought in as an investigator and collaborator and co-investigator in one of the experiments that dealt with fungulus. I had communicated with her sometime earlier. She had a real interest in the history of science and embryology, and, and she had given me some advice when we dealt with some of the early historical work on plant cell culture with Gottlieb Haberland. Jane actually had spent 
fair amount of time in Germany. So she knew the scene quite well, and she was a real charmer. Everyone liked her. She was a, a bit of a tartar, as old F.C. Stewart used to say. She, she didn't suffer fools gladly, but she was certainly uh, well-known, and we got to know each other and like each other. You can tell from her and her winter hat that uh, she's a cheerful type individual. We were glad to make contact with her. The final reports of the U.S. experiments flown on the Soviet satellite Cosmos 782 technical memorandum was not published until, I think, 1978. That was in the latter part. I believe simultaneously with the release of that report, a meeting was held in Washington. Thor Halstead had been the main convener, I believe, but perhaps she had not been on board very long at NASA headquarters. But in any case, I met her, Dr. Stewart met her, we both liked her, and that began a fairly long relationship that was very good and scientifically sound. She was is an incredible person, and I'll have more to say about them. The difficulty with that meeting was that many people who attended were kind of negative-minded in that they thought, well, why bother with any of this? It's expensive. Well, as it turned out, it wasn't anywhere near as expensive in terms of the investigators were concerned, the grants were rather modest, very modest, in fact. Maybe the operations took the big part of the budget, and that's more than likely true. I'm not intending to go into the financial aspect of it, but I can speak from experience that the funding levels were not humongous by any standards. They were rather small. Thor was a very good manager and managed to get the best out of a very low budget. One of the things that happened at the meeting was that Tex Baker's experiment on tumorogenesis in space had become very badly infected with fungus and had all but ruined all of the results. And the presentation that he gave at that time was rather discouraging in that it certainly did seem to emphasize that all was for naught. Texas passed on now. He was a very good guy, very able person. He had a long time experience in search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI as it were. He taught a course at Colorado State with that title. He had done some early work on the clinostat and tumorigenesis, et cetera. I need not go into detail on that. But in comparison, and quite by accident, Dr. Stewart and I came out looking a tiny bit better in that we'd pulled off the experiment and had actually gotten some results. The results were not easy to get. I've made it sound as though the setup was straightforward, which it was. It involved a huge amount of work. But recovery was every bit as difficult and time-consuming and labor-intensive. First task, of course, was that we would photograph everything. And then the real work began. One thing that became clear right at the outset was that nothing catastrophic had occurred. Embryogenesis had proceeded. Somatic embryos had formed. So to that extent, once again, nothing catastrophic had happened. Once the material got back at Stony Brook, the idea was to recover material which had been embedded in agar medium in such a way that sepsis was maintained and that we could continue our investigations. This involved taking each of the dishes, exposing it to sterile nutrient medium, 
allowing the agar to soften and to fish out various stages so that they could be categorized and put into other dishes so that they could be counted and so on. It was a lot of work. And here's a picture of Ron Dutcher struggling under conditions that were, again, not easy because we still hadn't moved into the new building. You can see some plastic ripples. The aseptic facilities were achieved by isolating certain areas of the laboratory so that the hood environment, the aseptic hood environment that we'd later use, or aseptic room environment that we later would use, was not available. Now, the stages that we decided to put things into are shown in this picture where the organized structures from cultured cells of wild carrot were put into various and sundry stages for purposes of counting and evaluation. A at the upper left represents a heart-shaped embryoid. B and C show two structures, the first, a very early stage two. It's a torpedo-like structure, and the second is a late torpedo. It too was a stage two categorization, according to us at least. D represents a still later growth form, stage three, showing a distinct root, but a rather abbreviated shoot. E and F show two forms categorized as stage four. The one at E shows a well-developed root and a clearly recognizable shoot. The other shows a poorly developed shoot, but with a very long root. The root is so long that only a portion of it may be seen. So the idea that these were fished out for counting and further manipulation can't be emphasized too much. Now, this particular bar graph shows all of the material that was investigated, put into different categories. For purposes of strict comparison, though, the first two bars are all that we need to worry about. Others, while comparable, are not comparable using the strictest and most fastidious methods. Now, when we did this and cogitated quite a lot, we said, well, we'll put out a paper. And in April of 1978, we submitted to science a paper which did, in fact, get published. But I want to throw in a couple of bits here that would not be obvious. The title was Morphogenetic Responses of Cultured Totipotent Cells of Carrot at Zero Gravity. Once again, the idealistic idea of zero gravity. The article was well received. It was short, perhaps too short. The imagery had been reduced substantially. We basically had starting material ending with the plantlet that had been recovered in a aseptic tube at the lower right. The data was potboiled to the point where we compared flight 0G and flight 1G on the centrifuge on board the spacecraft, which was very good and apparently uh, well enough received so that special comment was made on it by others. I had submitted a plate which was much larger, easier to see and examine, but they said, oh, it's taking up too much room. I think what you should do is shorten it. So we did. And that kind of thing peeved me 
I guess it was standard for the day. They didn't want to take long articles. The amount of work between the cells that flew and that were recovered and brought the full maturation is what I was concerned with in that no one can understand how much work is involved in all of this. We submitted even a image of what I thought was an attractive bunch of wild carrots flowering that had been recovered. And again, the idea that this material had been pulled out with so much labor and brought through the paces was something that I was very sensitive to. I thought, well, these people are really very anxious. The other part that we had done, which I thought was very good and really demanding of effort, was to follow the units sequentially in time so that you started off with a unit and ended up with a somatic embryo, top left, as it were, all the way down to the bottom right. If anyone thinks that's easy to do, they're welcome to try it. The greenhouse space that we utilized was generous. Here's just a partial view of some of it. But again, the idea that a biennial plant would be brought to flowering in the second year was no trivial achievement. Now, Dr. Stewart had gone to Moscow to deliver the final results report. I was teaching, and it was really good that he took the responsibility of going. He was in a little bit of a bad mood, I don't hesitate saying, because when we were in Moscow together in 75, and I emphasize that we were well looked after, the one thing that I did not bring up is that he got pickpocketed at the Moscow service. And it wasn't just that his wallet with money was pickpocketed. They took his passport. But that really didn't have that much effect, I don't think, on the presentations at the meeting that he went to. He took notes. They weren't terribly detailed, but they certainly dealt with what was important. The presentation that he made was well received. But the main philosophical point that came out, which was also uh, scientific, was that the main point was that there were no significant differences that had occurred between the development of the carrot cells in the darkness at 1G on the centrifuge and at near 0G conditions in flight. The possibility that no growth of any kind occurred during flight, that is, that it had already occurred prior to liftoff in the biotransporters, was minimal. Hopefully it didn't exist. That meant that the only dilemma or question that remained would be as follows. Could cells subjected to an asymmetric 1G stimulus, as in the biotransporters at four degrees Celsius, plus or minus two degrees for six days and 14 and a half hours prior to liftoff at ambient room temperature, could receive an implanted 1G stimulus or message, quote, unquote, that is during this protracted presentation time which could allow them, when they did develop into embryos, subsequently to do so independently of any gravitational stimulus. Now, Dick Young, back in 1970s, uh, had raised similar important questions with special reference to experiments performed in space using animal embryos. The only way of testing that could be to ensure that cells get into orbit with 1G and near zero G exposures without any protracted or asymmetric exposure to gravity 
and with the further test that cells actually produced at zero G, again from plantlets, into a course of development at contrasted 1G and 0G. In other words, this would be analogous to the seed to seed, but this would be embryo to embryo, or somatic embryo to somatic embryo. The notes that Dr. Stewart took from Madame Butenko's talk start off by saying, nothing much to add. Two-thirds of the material went to the USA, namely us. One-third went to the Soviets. The final conclusion made by Madame Butenko was in full agreement with the USA. She did, in fact, apparently make some kind of a comment that they would have preferred to do better statistics had more samples been made available. Well, <laughs> we were in the same boat. But she did apparently make some additional statements, presented some data on the elongation zones in those that made longer routes in space than on Earth. But Dr. Stewart thought that there was, in fact, no statistics that had been done, and knowing how much variation there was in the population, that was not that easy to uh, believe. Now, the interesting thing is that Dr. Stewart made a contact at the meeting that proved to be rather interesting. He was much impressed, he told me afterwards, with a guy named Dr. Peterson, who worked at the University of San Francisco. He was a physicist. And they had made presentations on the uh, radiation that had been tracked in the Cosmos 782. Now, it's a sign of Dr. Stewart's skepticism and a little bit of his let's say, quasi-suspicion or contempt of the Soviets that I might say went back to World War II, post-World War II, his, uh, Dr. Stewart, being a, a very firm advocate of the Churchillian perspective of empire and the fact that the Russians should have been put in their place after the war to save a lot of uh, trouble. A little bit of this had to underlie the mentality because he then took the view, well, look, there's no proof that this stuff ever really flew in space. He said, all we can go by is what they said. Now, Dr. Peterson apparently had methodology available to him that was rather sophisticated. Dr. Stewart wrote a note to Larry Chambers by hand from his home in Charlottesville, Virginia, where he was living after his retirement. Early in the year, January 12th, he, he says, look, I may seem to be carrying the role of devil's advocate to unreasonable lengths. I would still like to be reassured on the basis of evidence rather than faith. If there is any other evidence not known to us from the spacecraft in flight that bears on this problem, please let us know. Otherwise, if challenged to supply evidence that our 0G and 1G canisters actually flew and sustained these conditions, we can only say the Russians told us so. Now, this idea of tracking so-called etchable tracks of cosmic rays on plastic really seems to have struck a bell with Dr. Stewart. So I had to send some plastic Petri dishes, the Falcon dishes that had been newly developed, to San Francisco, and the answer that we got back was that the methods used in producing these things were so harsh that the plastic was not suitable to serve as a detector. There was a lot of warping, apparently, and etching tracks that were put in during manufacture. 
He said it was a good idea in principle, but Mother Nature is not so easily fooled. I would suggest two things. One, use polycarbonate plastic petri dishes because we know that this plastic is a more sensitive cosmic ray detector. Or two, attach a piece of cellulose nitrate plastic to your flight canister for removal and testing after the mission. Cellulose nitrate has the highest sensitivity of any plastic detector. I could supply these if needed. And there's an asterisk, and Dr. Stewart has written on it, but I would add a third, namely, use every diplomatic effort to ensure the presence of a U.S. observer at launch and recovery sites, FCS. Now, I do think he was really pushing the situation. There was absolutely no reason to think that these samples did not fly. Emily Holton, who had a very excellent experiment on the same mission with her colleagues. Emily was for quite a few years at NASA Ames Research Center at Moffett Field performed experiments on that particular cosmos as well as others dealing with the inhibition of bone formation during spaceflight. This incidentally corrected itself after it came back to Earth given a period of time. But the clear-cut evidence that the deposition of bone was very much diminished in space couldn't have happened unless her samples flew. And since our samples were on the same thing that her things flew on, then we can, I think, safely say that everything flew. The Russian presentations took a little bit of time catching up, but they were eventually translated into English. And by that time, we had really pretty much gone all the way. The photographs that we're going to see quickly in succession are the cultures containing developing embryonal structures, somatic embryos, if you will, or embryoids, and weightlessness, the KF1, and then the KF, oh, well, the KF2, and dishes that were A, B, C, etc. We don't want to go into too much detail on those. It's all very clear cut and covered. In 1979, a volume was put out that summarized a lot, but not all, of the Cosmos series. Evgeny Ilyan, Eugene Ilyan, was one of the editors. And one of the things that I thought that was interesting is that in this volume, not too much effort was put into the presentation of the authorship. It was almost done as an incidental passing. Now, the Soviet style at that time was that the person is minimal, the state's all important, science is done by us. We don't have to personally take credit or be egotistic about the whole thing. It was kind of amusing to see that all of our report had, for all practical purposes, been translated into Russian and stuck in there with a few other tidbits here and there. But that's all well and good. The collaboration was good but not excellent, and part of that was due to the fact that I'm sure the Soviets had their own agenda of wanting to make it clear that none of what we learned could have been achieved without their uh, hegemony and kindness. And that's true. But the idea of collaboration as equals really hadn't gained hold yet. Maybe it was personalities, maybe it wasn't. But given this business of differences in space, having taken the trouble to rear everything, fastidiously pulling things out, 
following them, keeping incredible records that would be enough to harass anybody. We ended up then, quite a long time later, trying to be more uh, modern in our outlook, tried to integrate some of the findings into the perspective of when can we really expect gravity to be altering things in terms of growth and development. In other words, put it on a new footing. Well, I can tell you one thing, that it was a little bit too early to be doing that kind of thing. It may sound as though it's more scientific, but you have to have the capability of doing it. You can't on one hand say, well, you've got this tiny thing smaller than a shoebox, put your experiment in it in the dark, and then see if you can tell us whether there's a, a gravity effect or a centrifuge effect or a space environment effect that's not gravity related, a space environmental uh, effect and gravity, etc. So again, it's uh, all well and good. We were given Cosmos Achievement Awards, namely a piece of paper uh, with the attractive logo on it. And it was certainly uh, welcome, it kind of added a little bit of uh, color to all of the work. What really should have been done at that time was that that award really should have been given to Ron Dutcher and Liz Yim as well as Dr. Stewart and myself. But that mentality hadn't come into being just yet, and it was only till considerably later that NASA was more amenable to giving awards to um, quite a few different people involved in the teams. That does not mean that the work and the role played by technical staff and assistants and associates was any the less. Now, the second part of this film is some footage that's been taken from 16 millimeter film and copied digitally so that one can get a feeling for the preparation of the experimental material. F. Ronald Dutcher and Elizabeth Taquang Yim are shown here. Uh, Elizabeth, as I said, got her PhD sometime later at the University of Hong Kong and was uh, on the staff there. Ron Dutcher was an undergraduate at Stony Brook. In fact, he worked in my laboratory that early. He did a master's at Stony Brook with me, so he was well familiar with me as a person and also procedures in general. Here we see the so-called clean room with manipulations being carried out by Liz and Ron. You see the sieves are being tapped very gently, sieving cells to get specific fractions is done serially. That is to say, you just don't chuck stuff through a sieve and expect to get the right fraction. You have to do it in a graded way. Again, you can see Liz tapping and flaming with alcohol. Alcohol lamps were important because natural gas contains toxic substances and it's been long known that it's best to use alcohol lamps. There we go again, gently tapping. Everything's been pre-sterilized. You notice a lot of aluminum foil to cover things like uh, the beakers and Erlenmeyer flasks. Frequent washing down of the surface. Waiting for things to settle, examining things, and now some tubes, glass tubes, in which settling and centrifuging is carried out. These are rather rare now. In fact, I would go so far as to say you can't get them. Pouring, decanting, allowing to settle, getting the right volumes, all very deliberate and carefully carried out. The smoothness which it, all of this is done Ron's joking there, drinking the 
fluid is an indication how they've worked a long time hand in glove. There's Liz smiling, Ron's chuckling in the background as well. Now what we're doing is getting things ready so as to distribute the cells into an agar medium. Remember we said it's important to have the temperature right, it's not too hot, not too cold, baby bottle warm, so as to allow the cells to survive and the agar not to congeal too early. Very gentle, deliberate pouring, constant flaming, so as to keep and maintain asepsis. That large bottle in the back is 70% ethanol. Here come the plastic Petri dishes manufactured by Falcon. The snap tight lid dishes were just then being released. They're brand new, saved a lot of grief, not having to use biofilm or parafilm, any of those kinds of sealants. There's Liz testing temperature on her wrist. Apparently it's getting closer to the proper temperature. Out comes a glass pipette. We always use glass rather than plastic, which was then coming into being because of potential toxicity. These cells are very sensitive. Now careful pouring of the sample into the dishes. The dishes were labeled with diamond tip markers so that the position could be maintained and the stacking could be carried out in an orderly fashion. Here we get a closer view of the dishes being filled. On all of these things, prior tests had shown that what we were doing was the right thing. Now they're going on to a micro sill standoff, very carefully stacked and arranged. You notice the deliberation with which it's being done. There'll be a rather tight fit to cushion the dishes This is an important step, very important, so that the dishes are kept in place firmly. Ron's in the background attaching the lid, the anodized aluminum end cap, which had on it machine tool labels, which canister it was, etc. Here's Liz in the foreground arranging the microsill standoff very carefully, pushing it into the tube which had been pre-sterilized, not by autoclaving but by ethanol and then outgassing to get rid of any residual alcohol. Here they go in tightly fitted HEPA filter, job's getting close to being finished, here's Liz in the foreground, 
filling the transporter. The fellow on the right is an undergraduate, Jonathan Hurwitz, who worked in the lab also. There they are, gently being put in. And as I said, when they got to Ames Research Center, they would be again tightened with a torque wrench properly and put into place and loaded. Now, controls would be run on the rotating apparatus. Additional cell cultures would be transferred and maintained so that different stages could be followed. Here they are carefully being attached. When you get good enough at it, the wheels can still rotate and you can attach the flasks. So here they are, one RPM, one revolution per minute at about four to five degrees axis. Last by no means least, I want to thank Gene Taylor who took that initial footage but more importantly, put this thing together and edited it carefully. Without him, it would not have been done.